You were here for the sunrise service, and you know we read the account of Jesus' tomb from Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And for this service, it will be in the same passage, but we'll have a different message from it to, uh, for this service. Again, Mark chapter 16, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher, the tomb, at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man, that is an angel, sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not he. Behold the place where they laid him. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we ask for your anointing. We ask for the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, no doubt a number of needs are represented here today, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. No doubt some of us have some loved ones in our lives that uh, we would like to lift up for special prayer today. Lord, we lift them up to you this morning. Lord, we thank You for this Resurrection Sunday where we come and we celebrate uh, the empty tomb. Our God is great because of what is no longer in the tomb. Lord, bless each one that's here today now as Your Word goes out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I no longer take it for granted that people just know what Easter is and what this weekend is all about because we all come from different backgrounds. Some of us were raised in church and we're here all the time and that's wonderful and that's great. For some of you, this may be your first time in a church service and that's okay too. Let me say to you, well, we're so glad that you are here. You see, it's not about how you start this race that we call life. It's how you finish. And we're all on a journey this morning. And it's possible that someone walked in here today in a crisis. This Easter weekend for you, you or your family, someone that you love is in the midst of a crisis. And you don't know what to do next. It's possible that someone else here today is confused and, and hurting. And, and maybe you've been hurt by church people, whether it was intentional or not. And, and you're giving it one more shot this morning. It's likely that there are some folks here, perhaps some marriages, some relationships, some that are crumbling today. Others of you, you may have some health concerns, maybe even some addictions that you're dealing with. But beyond all of these needs, the greatest need for each and every one of us, one of us is to know where I will go whenever I breathe my last breath. What will happen to me whenever I die? Let me tell you, if you are in pain, if you are scared this morning, if you have been on the wrong path, if you are discouraged, if you have lost hope and you're not even sure if you want to continue to live, then let me assure you that you have come to the right place. Let me introduce you to Jesus this morning. Jesus, the Son of God, He suffered greatly as we know. He was arrested. He went through mock trials. He was bruised and beaten for us. He had that crown of thorns pressed upon His precious head. Ultimately, He went to that cross and He was crucified for you. And you may say, Jeffrey, how was that for me? I wasn't alive back then. I wasn't there. You see, everyone in this room this morning and everyone parked in the cars outside today is a sin. I may or may not know your name. I may not know what you ate for dinner last night. I may not know much about you at all. In fact, you may say that people know a lot about you, 
because of your past. Whether they read your name in the arrest reports or whatever it might be. For some of you, your name may be well known because of some great things that you've done. You have given a lot of time and money in the community and you're a model citizen. But this much I know is true for each and every one. Every person in this room, every person in the bars this morning, including the speaker, standing behind this pulpit is a sinner. I have missed some more. I have done some things in my life that has not pleased God. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God is in heaven and sin cannot enter heaven. And if I want to go to heaven whenever I die, there's a problem that is presented here. God, I, I want to be where God is. And if I'm a sinner, I cannot get to heaven on my own because I have sinned. My sin will keep me out of heaven. And the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus, God in the flesh, came to this earth. And He lived a perfect, sinless life. And He died for you. His precious blood was shed for you. He took your place when He died on that cross as your substitute. But you see, the cross isn't the end of it. Jesus died on that cross. Yes, He did. He was buried. But the glorious news about Easter this morning is that Jesus rose from the grave. Amen. And in our text, in verse 1, a group of women had seen where Jesus had been buried. And so they bought some spices. This was done to anoint the body of Jesus. And so they're coming to this grave with these spices. Sort of like today, we might go to a grave with flowers. And so they, they're there. But Jesus was dead. And early that Sunday morning, they came to that garden tomb where He had been placed. And when they arrived, they discovered and were told by an angel. He said, don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus so naturally who was crucified. He isn't here. Look, this is where they laid His body. Our emphasis today is going to be on verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. These women are headed to that tomb earth. They're chatting perhaps. It must have gone to one of the women in the group that they must have said, hey, who's going to roll away that heavy stone from the front of the tomb? But we know in verse 4 that God had already taken care of the problem had. You see, this tomb where Jesus was laid would have had a stone that would have rolled across the front of it. And it would have been, it would have weighed several hundred pounds and it would have been in a trap. It would have been easier to close that tomb as it fell into that group than to try to reopen it again. And we know that the Bible says that it was sealed by the Roman soldiers. And so it would have taken several men to roll this stone away. And so these women would not be able to get into that tomb on their own. We'll come back to that thought in just a moment. Some of you may have gone to bed last night and maybe even woke up this morning with similar feelings as these women and as the other followers of Jesus must have felt on this day. Put yourself in their shoes for a moment. They have followed Jesus for a few years now. They have watched Him perform miracles. They had seen Him feed thousands. They saw Him heal the sick and raise the dead and calm fierce storms at sea. And those were the good days. But now Jesus is dead. The dream is over. People like Joseph of Arimathea, the disciples, Mary, the godly women who stood by Jesus at the cross, they must now be going through some of the greatest despair and depression of their earthly existence. They had answered the Lord's call. They left all to follow Him, but now Jesus is dead. It all seems to be over with no glimmer of hope. The Saturday before the resurrection. 
It must have been a day of shattered dreams, broken hearts, a gloomy day, a day in which no words could lift the spirits of Jesus' followers. Think of Mary, the mother of Jesus. As she looked on that day and saw her son crucified there on the cross, a sword must have deeply pierced her soul. Think of Peter and the heavy guilt that he must have felt as he denied Jesus three times and the rooster crowed. Think of the beloved disciple John as he stood there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and as Jesus hung on the cross, he told John to take care of his mother. Oh, how his heart must be broken now. Think of Mary Magdalene and the tears that she shed there at the garden too. Jesus is dead. As I said in the beginning, all of us have experienced some of this in our lives. Shattered dreams, broken hearts, bad news. More people today are living in despair. More people today are living in the darkness of Saturday than they are in the victory of Sunday. Someone has called the present generation Saturday children. Saturday children. You see, our great American cities are for the most part filled with pools of human misery where people live out their days without hope. People's hearts are gripped with fear and despair and hopelessness and meaninglessness fills our cities and our towns, our communities, our neighborhoods, and there are our homes today. Church, it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus came to give hope to the world. Back to our text in verse 3. The women must be worried and filled with emotion when they thought of the problem that they were going to have. How are we going to move? How are we going to get in there to anoint Jesus' body to put these spices on it? There's that big tooth, that big stone is over it, the covering. They had not reached the tomb on this two-mile journey when this problem of theirs came to their mind. And as I said earlier, many of you today, God knows your hearts. He looks beyond the flesh and bones into the very depths of your soul this morning. He knows your heart. He knows what problems you are facing. He knows what you're concerned about today. And these women, they could have said as they're walking along, who's going to roll back the stone? Well, we don't have anybody. Let's turn around and go back home. They could have given up and done that. They could have said, let's turn back and go home. How often do we allow problems in life to discourage us, to cause us to give up too soon, to have us feeling hopeless? We think, that, we think ourselves, I'll never see this problem come to an end. And we think, I'll never be able to get through this thing. And we sort of give up on life. Church, just as God had already taken care of the problem with the stone, He's already taken care of the greatest problem that you and I will ever face. That is your salvation. And if He has taken care of the greatest problem that you will ever have, if He has taken care of the greatest problem I will ever have, which of course He went to the cross for, then will He not take care of your lesser problems also? You see, there's a precious lesson here in verses 3 and 4 for us. How often have we set out on our day Looked ahead to the future we dread when the day arrived or when the time came, but we found that God had already rolled away the stone for us. There have been many times in my life when I wondered how something was going to work out. I wondered, Lord, there's no hope now. It's all over. It's all gone. I may have prayed about it. I may have lost sleep over it. It consumed my thoughts. How will I remove tomorrow's obstacle? How will this thing be resolved? But I have discovered time and time again that God had taken care of it. Let me ask you, what stone lies ahead for you 
this morning. What stone lies ahead? No problem is too heavy for God. No problem, no situation is too big for Him. These women in our text, when they thought about the stone, they pressed on. They kept on heading towards that too. And they're now walking by faith, you see. One of them apparently expressed that concern, but they kept on. They kept on. I wonder, will you continue to walk on trusting God by faith? And verse 4 says, when they got there, what? The stone was rolled away. Now, if you were to compare verses 3 and 4 in English, they look very similar in our Bibles. But I learned something else this week. In the Greek, in verse 3, the women had asked, who will roll away? The stone. And in verse 4, although we see those words, in the Greek, what God did was more than roll away the stone. That stone was rolled up. That is, it was completely out of the way. It was off his track. It was off his guide. This means that it would have taken an army of men to go and replace that stone back over that tomb. If it had just been rolled back, you see, those Roman soldiers wanting to cover this whole thing up of Jesus missing and His body missing, what they could have done is, let's rip roll this thing back. They could have got maybe 18 men and rolled it back and just said, oh, Jesus is in there. Resealed, oh, He's still in there. But the stone was completely moved away from in front of the tomb. And anyone who wanted to see that it was empty, could. You see, that's one thing about our God that we don't need to forget. The women wanted to know that who could just roll it away. But God did much more. He completely moved the thing out of the way. Isn't that how God works in our lives? He exceeds our expectations Time and time again. And the tomb was empty. And the angel announced, He is risen. <laughs> you see, they had all been Saturday's children before, worried and depressed. But then they became Sunday's children, filled with joy and hope of the resurrection. I wonder about you today. How about you? Are you living as one of Saturday's children with its despair and its worry? Or are you living in Sunday bursting forth with hope? I told you at the beginning that Easter is about hope. And the small problem of this stone being rolled away there, God took care of it. And the big problem for a lost and sinful world was taken care of by the empty tomb for all who will come to Christ. But you may be sitting there and I'm almost through. You may be saying, Jeffrey, what does the resurrection have to do with me? If today is all about hope, then, then what hope does the resurrection offer to someone like me? First, it tells us that Jesus was more than a man. He wasn't just a good teacher, but his body was missing on Sunday morning. And all the other religions today, they go to a leader whose remains are in a grave somewhere. But Jesus is greater than they are. Jesus is God. Another important fact about this resurrection and the hope is this. Secondly, I know that I can be forgiven. What a burden that is lifted when I know that all the trouble I have caused in the past, all the things that I've done wrong, I don't have to just uh, hold those things around and pull and drag those things behind me no matter how bad they are. Uh, because of Jesus' resurrection, I can be forgiven. And that sin this morning is weighing you down. I don't know what you did last night. I don't know what you did last week or last month. But if you're carrying some guilt, if you're carrying some burdens this morning, and it's weighing and pressing and crushing you, you can have forgiveness by believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Thirdly and finally, the resurrection offers hope to me because I know that the grave is not the end. We don't like the subject of death. I'm sure when you're with your friends here and there, y'all don't talk about death a lot. Y'all don't like to talk, most people don't. But the reality is that if the Lord tarries His coming, that every person in this room and every person in the cars this morning will one day breathe their last breath and their heart will beat for the last time. Again, if the Lord doesn't return first. But the resurrection of Jesus lets us know for certain that the grave is not the end. I'm going to end with this. I came across this illustration. I'm sure many of you have spent some time at a swimming pool during the summer. And sometimes with children, people may throw some things in a, in a pool, maybe the deep end, some plastic rings or something like that, and they'll sink to the bottom, and you may have a little contest seeing who can gather the most rings and stay under the water before coming up. And you may stay under that water for a period of time, but eventually a person will come bursting forth to the top. That's what happened to Jesus on Sunday morning. That's sort of what it was like. That grave could no longer hold our Lord, so He came bursting forth out of that water. I mean, out of that grave. I ask you again this morning, are you living in the hopelessness of Saturday? Nothing seems to be right in your life. You're irritated and agitated, frustrated every single day of sin. Are you living in Saturday? Or are you living in Sunday? Bursting forth with hope. I know this has been a tough year for Christians and really the whole world. But here we are this morning. We've made it for another Easter Sunday to celebrate our Lord's uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And my prayer is today that you will drive away from this place with burdens lifted, with assurance that stones will be rolled away in the future, filled with the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're all on a journey today. We're all on a journey. And it's not the beginning that counts. It's the finish that counts. So, so what somebody came to Christ before you did? So what somebody's been in church for 30 years and you just started three weeks ago? That's okay. You commit today and you follow Him today. Again, it's how we finish the counts. You see, Jesus has already taken care of everybody's biggest problem in this room when He died for us. Have you come to Christ receiving what He did for you on your biggest problem? And then once you view life from that biggest problem of yours, then you can deal with all the smaller problems. Serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know He is living, no matter what men may say. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. Do you know Jesus today? Are you serving Jesus today? You come. The women ask, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the tomb? And when they look, they saw the sun was rolled away. Would you bow for everyone, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments to share your word. And Lord, it is just like you to exceed our expectations. Sometimes when we start praying about something, we have a particular thing in mind, but Lord, when it's all said and done, we look back and say, Lord, you give so much more than what I ever imagined. Whatever could see could be done. Lord, you give so much more. And Lord, I believe perhaps there's some folks here today who are struggling with some things in their life. It might be regarding them personally. It might be something else that's going on. I don't know. But Lord, you do. And Lord, I pray that they'll view this problem that these women have with this tomb and being able to open the tomb and remember that God took care of that stuff. 
Lord, help us to remember that you are good. You've taken care of our greatest problem on that old cross. And then with that empty tomb, we know that all of us shall live eternally, either in heaven or in hell. And Lord, I pray that should there be one on the sound of my voice this morning who does not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for that one. Lord, whether they respond publicly now or pray with me right after the service, whatever it might be, Lord, I pray that You'll help them to come to Jesus. Lord, for the Christian here today, they know that they're saved. They know that they have eternal life. They believe that You died for them and You rose for them. But Lord, they're struggling with something in their life right now. They're sort of worried or concerned or afraid. They've got something on sort of like these women heading to the tomb. They're living as a child of Saturday instead of a child of Sunday. Lord, help them to realize, press upon them, Lord, deeply what You've done with them. Lord, instill in them the hope of the resurrection. Lord, bless, we pray, O oh, Holy Spirit, go up and down these eyes and along these pews. Help us, Lord, to respond truthfully to You during these moments. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.